Um, many of my friends up there in Fukushima Prefecture and I are concerned about a lot of the uh, disinformation and the misinformation that is being spewed about by many blogs out there about the children of Fukushima. Um, if, you're, if you've been watching this situation, if you're still concerned about what's going on in Fukushima, you may have noticed some uh, newspaper articles or you know, radio or television uh, reports about uh, thyroid cancer incidents or thyroid abnormal growth incidents in, amongst the children of Fukushima in the last couple of months. Um, I've been delving into this, I've been researching this really, really hard for the last couple of months, and I can, I can tell you uh, that most of what you're hearing is exaggerated, or at the very least, you're only getting one side of the argument. You're only getting one side of the news item here. Um, a lot of places will report that uh, there's, you know, a high incidence of uh, what you call nodules or cysts in the thyroid of Fukushima children. Now, the, the figure that they were bantying about was 41.2%, and that came from a government announcement. That came from a government report that uh, was conducted. There, there Actually, um, this is really amazing. This is, this is unprecedented. 133,000 children, or more than 133,000 children in Fukushima Prefecture have had thyroid exams in the last year and a half. Now, this has never happened, never happened anywhere in Japan uh, since the creation, uh, since the beginning of time. Uh, 133,000 of them have had thyroid exams and uh, 41 0.2% of them uh, demonstrated what you call a prevalence of nodules or cysts in their uh, thyroid. Now, this sounds like a really, really scary number. Um, you're thinking, well, wow, what, you know, what do they got there? Um, a nodule is basically an area of dense tissue in the thyroid, okay, or anywhere in your body for that example. And a cyst is an area of dense tissue or hard tissue that has uh, liquid inside of it. In other words, uh, uh, pus. Um, it's sort of like a pimple on your thyroid, okay? Um, and so these nodules and cysts, 41.2% uh, prevalence, that just sounded really scary. But uh, after they made that announcement, they also announced that they had done control uh, investigations or, con or control studies on uh, over 5,000 kids and teenagers in other parts of Japan for comparison. Now, these these other kids were in in far flung regions. Um, one area was up in Aomori, Hirosaki City, I believe it was, uh, which is in the far north of Japan. Uh, another one was uh, another test was taken in uh, Yamanashi Prefecture, which is in the central part of Japan, and another study was conducted in Nagasaki Prefecture, which is in the far western part of Japan. They took they took these three control groups and they combined their statistics and they found that the prevalence of nodules and cysts amongst those five thousand some odd children uh, came to fifty six percent. Now, kids in Fukushima had 41.2%, so they were actually comparatively on the low side. Um, statistically speaking, it's not very significant, but it does show that the, that the kids in Fukushima are not very different from the kids in the rest of Japan. That said, um, while they were doing these thyroid exams on 133,000 some odd kids in uh Fukushima, they did discover that three of them had uh, cancerous growths on their thyroids. Now, three kids, okay? Now, a lot of blogs went to, they, they, they went crazy with this. They said, oh, this, you know, this is, this is only a one out of a million, uh, uh, this, this disease, thyroid cancer, only happens in one out of a million people or one out of a million kids in Japan or anywhere in the world for that matter and they thought that uh, they, they stated that the cancer th uh, the thyroid cancer incident rate amongst Fukushima kids was skyrocketing you know you see this on a lot of blogs they say that it's out of control kind of thing and I 
read that, and I, of course, I was as scared as everybody else. And I went into the statistics on this, and I, uh, I actually accessed the can the what do they call it the uh, the uh, the National Cancer Center of Japan, which is a, a research institute that does nothing but sit around and calculate all kinds of statistics about the incidence rates of cancer in Japan. And it said, and these are national statistics, that the occurrence rate amongst uh, teenagers in Japan, and this is nationwide, is for boys from the age of uh, 10 to 19 is 0 0.34 per 100,000. And the incidence rate amongst girls is 1.2 per 100,000. Unfortunately, girls get thyroid cancer at a rate of about three or four to one over boys. Um, you combine those two numbers and you get an, you get an incidence rate of 0 0.77 per 100,000 population. Now, if you apply that, that rate, that incident rate, to the number of kids in Fukushima at the time of the accident, and the number of kids in Fukushima at that time was 377,500. You apply that rate and you come up with an expected occurrence or incidence of thyroid cancers amongst that population in Fukushima Prefecture of 2.9. Okay, they actually found three. Okay. The difference between 2.9 and 3 is, statistically speaking, not all that significant. So no, absolutely no. The number of thyroid cancers occurring amongst kids in Fukushima is not skyrocketing. If anything, it's quite normal. Um, it's still worrisome because we really don't know the overall effects of, of uh, the spread of iodine-131 around the prefecture of, thir of uh, around Fukushima prefecture because... Um, we really won't know for another two to three years. We know from studies at Chernobyl after the accident they had there back in 1986 that there was no spike in thyroid cancer until about four to five years after the accident amongst teenagers mainly. Um, that said, uh, some other very, very good news that you may be interested in is that the kids in Chernobyl, uh, the reason they had 6,000 cases of teenager, uh, what do you call it, thyroid cancer amongst teenagers yeah. around Chernobyl after the accident, four to five years, and they're still having problems with it amongst fairly young adults and things like that. But uh, the reason that they had such a high incidence of thyroid cancer around Chernobyl is because the government there did not order its people to stop eating uh, local produce and to stop drinking locally produced milk. Now, the Japanese government issued an order the day of the accident and the day after the accident. They reiterated it uh, for people not to consume milk products or any kind of produce, you know, made locally there in Fukushima. So that means that the internal uh, exposure to radiation amongst kids and amongst the entire population of Fukushima Prefecture is going to be very, very low. But I've got some other data here about external radiation, which can also, of course, affect the, uh, <clears throat> the thyroid gland and things like that. Uh, according to, and this is another survey that was taken amongst 386,572 residents of Fukushima at the time of the accident. They were surveyed as to where they were and where they moved within the four months after the accident. And... According to the statistics that were also announced on January uh, 31st, 2013, just a couple of months ago, 66% of the people of Fukushima Prefecture tested or surveyed to that point received less than one millisiever, the vast majority having received none. 66%, uh, okay? A further 29% received less than two millisieverts of radiation, and a further 4% received less than 3%. Now you put all those numbers together and you have 99% of the people of Fukushima received less than three millisieverts during the first four months after the accident. Uh, and considering that 99%, according to statistics here again, 99% of all the radiation released 
at uh, after the Fukushima accident was released within the first month after the accident, all of these people, 99% of the people of Fukushima Prefecture, did not receive more than three millisieverts during the first year after the accident. And they have received much, much less this second year. Um, that said, we still do have a small cohort, about 1% of the people who received more than three. But looking at the numbers here, um, they're really not all that scary. Um, as a matter of fact, according to these statistics, and again, this, these were all amount, announced back on January 31st, um, only 12 people surveyed so far received more than 15 millisieverts of radiation, depending on where they were at the time of the, the largest releases, etc. Um, the, largest release, the largest releases happened on, I, 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 uh, if I recall correctly here, were on March 15th and March 21st of 2011. Um, Ninety percent of the people within the twenty-kilometer evacuation zone had already evacuated by that time. So we we still have a fairly small cohort of people who were in danger's way. Now those twelve people, though, of course, are are concerned there. Uh, of those twelve people, it was later announced that even though they received more than fifteen millisieverts in the first four months after the accident. It was judged, or it was estimated, that they all received less than 30 millisieverts. Now, this is all; these are all numbers, and I know this is very confusing, but according to all international um, radiology safety organizations that I have been able to research so far, anything less than 50 millisieverts is, uh, you're, is no cause for concern. Um, amongst academics and amongst radiologists and, and other people, there is a lot of argument about the area between 50 millisieverts and 100 millisieverts. But as far as I've been able to ascertain so far through my research over the last couple of years, anything less than 100 millisieverts uh, will cause no measurable harm to health. It, I mean, a lot of people will argue with me on this point, but... Um, I haven't seen any convincing evidence that has been uh, uh, peer-reviewed and, uh, and is accepted by the general scientific community uh, that anything up below 100 millisieverts will harm your health. Everybody in Fukushima got less than 30. So, obviously, we're still going to have to keep an eye on these people, these 12 people or so that, did, that were exposed to the highest rates. But it is not... Uh, you know, these people are being watched like you wouldn't believe. Um, every kid, everybody who was under the age of 18 at the time of the accident um, will be uh, examined on a periodic basis, probably on a basis of between one and two years, every one and two years, for the rest of their lives. The national government and the Fukushima prefectural government have both committed themselves to do this. So it is, their, their prognosis is quite good. Even if they do demonstrate some problems, um, they're going to catch it very, very early and they're going to they're get the best treatment available in Japan. So again, all I really want to say is these statistics, I've been following this stuff for two years. It, the numbers that we're looking at are not really very much to get excited about. I would hope that before you make a donation to some of these blogs, and a lot of them, that's what they're doing. They are fishing for donations. They want you to send some money so that they can save the children of Fukushima. Um, a lot of money has already been donated to these blogs, and I don't see any of it being used up in Fukushima. Um, maybe some of it has, but a lot of it I'm sure has not. So please, people, before you make a donation to any of these blogs, um, don't waste your money. Check into the statistics, check into the numbers, read the articles. I'm translating a lot of these and I'm putting them up on my blog so you can take a look at them if you like. Um, we, we have other problems in this country. The, the big problem in Japan in northeastern Japan right now is the fact that uh, the rebuilding of some of these towns is, is taking more time than it should. I'm hoping that you will continue to think about those people who are 
slowly but surely rebuilding their businesses and rebuilding their homes and rebuilding their lives. Please continue to pray for these people and think about these people. And um, thank you for listening.